All right, we're here for another episode of a conversation, this time with a special guest, uh, my mother, Shirley Lynn. Hi, um, everybody. Very excited to kind of chop it up with her. It goes without saying uh, how much she has done for me, how much she has influenced me. I am who I am because of her. We're going to get into a lot of different topics, whether it's, you know, immigrant struggles, values, um, you know, this career path and chasing your dreams, handling adversity and, and dealing with me and my two brothers. So there's a lot that's coming for today's podcast. First off, do you want to give a little bit of your introduction? You know, talk about yourself. Uh, what are you up to these days? Who you are, I guess. Okay. I'm Shirley Lin and I'm Jeremy Lin's mom and I grew up in Taiwan. Uh, I went to U.S. when I, um, before I get to college. So my most of the time uh, living in U.S. And I was a computer engineer and for many, many, many years until Jeremy, uh, Draft to NBA. You know, I went undrafted, right? Oh, wow. Well, sorry. Undraft. <laughs> Until I signed in the NBA. Sorry. I'm just being technical here. There's a lot of stereotypes about the middle child. Um, what was I like growing up? You or me? I'm a middle child, too. Yeah, you are a middle child. <laughs> yeah, you would think that a middle child would know how to make their own middle child not feel like a middle child. I try my very <laughs> best to do that, but he doesn't agree to it, so I no, can't you help did, it. You did, you did what you could. You did what you could. Um, but no, what was I, what was I like as a, as a kid? Okay, you are very naughty. <laughs> <laughs> very naughty, very strong well, and I, to be honest, if you're the first one, I probably just have one kid. It's very hard to handle. It was that bad? It's very bad. When you was that age, it's like a, you get mad at me and you were so mad and you, you can ju you just start talking. You told me, you say, I'm going to move to Taiwan to with Nai Nai. And because you are mean to me, I was like, oh, okay. So I say, you sure you want to do that? And you say, yes, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm ready to move. I said, okay. So I, so I went ahead to get an empty suitcase. I was like, okay, Jeremy. You can start packing now. You sure you want to go? I will buy the ticket. I will make sure you get to Taiwan safely and, and just just start packing. And you look at me, you said, you're not so sure. So you went to Josh. You said, Josh, let's go to Taiwan to stay with Nai Nai. Mom's so mean. And Josh was telling you, say, Mom, Mom is not mean. Mom tried to teach us. She loves us, so she's teaching us. And later you come back and say, I'm not leaving. I was like, why? I already, I already, I already ready to purchase the ticket for you. You said, because you uh, discipline us because you love us. So I'm not leaving. <laughs> this is you. Okay. Nobody like that. I was, I, was sure, I was just making sure you're doing your job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Thanks for that. For keeping, <laughs> keeping you accountable, you know, needless to say, I was pretty much a perfect child, um, which I think we both can agree on. Very amazing, very obedient. Um, That's another way. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> we're never making. It, we're never going to make it through this podcast. <laughs> you want that one? <laughs> sure. You probably forget. When you start learning, call nine one one for emergency. Oh my gosh! And I remember this. So the police will come to help you. And so one day, um, you got spanked, and you was like, "I'm going to call police." I'm going to call 911, so police will come and get you. I was like, oh, shh, okay. So I pick up the phone, I say, Jeremy, here's the phone. Start dialing 911. But before you dial, I want to ask you a question. He said, like, what? I said, you think police will catch the bad person or good person? The not behaving one or the behaving one? He was like, police will catch the not behaving one. I said, okay, so here you go. Let's say police will catch you or catch me. <laughs> then you say, Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's enough stories for today about who I was as a child. We'll keep it okay. moving. Um, that is hilarious, though. That's amazing. Great stories. Uh, thanks for sharing that. You know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but growing up, uh, we had a lot of conflict. I fought with you by far more than anybody else. Any other, like a go away and never fought with you that much. Or anybody else on the whole world. <laughs> yeah, or anyone else in the whole world. Like, we fought the most, you know, a big part of that was because I felt like for a long time you thought I was dumb, 
you thought I was stupid. No, uh, you think I think you are stupid, yeah, not me. I th- I'm saying I thought that you thought that yeah. was stupid. Sorry. Yeah. So how do we begin to talk about that? We have a few big fight and basically you kind of in tear telling me, say, I know you think I'm stupid, but I'm not. I was like, I never think you're stupid. Why you keep thinking? So it's it's starting I start question myself. Things when you think you're stupid, you you're the most kind of smarty person um, in the family. But I was like, why he keep thinking? I think that way. Then we start kind of talking about it. And sometimes during the fight, sometimes not during the fight, um, but kind of alert that. Then I think the one really turned around is we went to Half Moon Bay. Is that that conversation? I would say that was uh, a huge turning point for us. You know, I think when I was young, it was more like I felt like you thought I was dumb. But then as I got older, I felt like you thought you couldn't respect me and respect me the same way that you could respect Gaga. So I always felt like the way that you treat Gaga and Wei is different than the way you treat me. I always felt like you're the hardest on me. It's, it wasn't intelligence at that point. It was more a matter of respect. Right. Um, And so I didn't see eye to eye with you. We had a lot of conflict. And then because we had so much history, it made it so that any time there is any type of trigger or anything, it would turn into a very explosive fight because we weren't giving each other the benefit of the doubt. We weren't really listening to each other. Um, And so we struggled with, you know, having a lot of conflict for for quite some time. It was gra- a gradual process, but there was one moment where there was a huge turning point, right? And that was that would be Half Moon Bay. Well, I think that day it's my birthday, or oh, Mother's Day, something. Mm-hmm. Some, Mother's some, Day. Yeah. Um, then you want to take me to whatever I want. I say, okay, let's go to Half Moon Bay. So we have a nice walking on the beach and nice meal by the beach. And you asked me a lot of my childhood story. I was like, you know what? What's what's the one thing that my mom always wants to do? You always want to walk on a beach. You never want to go into the ocean, but you want to walk on a beach. <laughs> yes, that's true. You hate going into the ocean. So first, of course, we had to, we drove an hour to Half Moon Bay. Uh, we had to go get... Uh, clam chowder, bread bowl, delicious, uh, you know, pier food. And then we took a walk. But during this, you know, we were together maybe like four or five hours. During this stretch, uh, literally all I did from the minute we got in the car all the way to the minute that we got back home was I just asked you questions, question after question after question. I started with your childhood. I started asking you all these different things about like, what was it like growing up with with, you know, Dai and Yo-Yo Ai, what was it growing up with your parents? What was it like in high school? What were you like in middle school? How was it when you first moved to the U.S.? How did you meet dad? Like, how did you guys know you were in love? What was it like when you first had your first child, right? Like I asked you so many of your childhood and background questions. And I finally, for the first time in my life at age like 25, I learned your, like very deeply learned your life story. And that like, changed completely changed how I viewed you because before I kept thinking why do you always want to save money and save money so much like why do you always why do you always like have to find every last discount you know why do you hold on to your children and like control so much and why did it was like why did you do this why do you do that why do you think like this right and finally after hearing your story I was like I totally get it because if I was you and I went through what you went through then I would probably react the same exact way, right? And so... So it's your change, not me change. Yeah, I, right? Like, I, I would you say understand it's, it's, me it's my turning point where I really understood like, hey, if I walked the same path that my mother walked, I would probably be parenting in a very similar way. And at the very least, even if I wasn't going to be parenting in a similar way, at least, like, I still didn't agree with the way that you handled everything, but at least I understand why you were doing it. And I realized that the motivation was more important than the execution of what you're doing, right? Your motivation was love. Your motivation was coming from what you had experienced in your past. And that was more important than what you actually did, which was right. Like sometimes you wouldn't let me go here or you didn't let me spend money on this or whatever it was. So that was really helpful, right? Like realizing, you know, I knew that your parents got a divorce, but I didn't know 
how bad it was, how long it was, how heartbreaking it was. I didn't know how that conflict continued to last for decades, right? I knew that you lost loved ones mm -hmm. uh, in a very, in very tragic ways, right? And, but when I really understood the story more in depth, I, I totally understood like why you cling onto family so closely and you do everything to keep your family close together because you lost somebody that meant so much to you, right? So all these different things, or even the immigrant struggle, right? For me, I was born and raised in the US and I knew that you and dad were immigrants. I knew you guys had it hard, but once I actually heard the stories about how you guys had to fish to be able to eat and all this other stuff, like it gave me a whole new level of appreciation of like, oh wow, that's, that's why she's really wants to make sure that we save money and, you know, do different things. And that's, that's why you make the decisions that you make. Um, so that was a big turning point for me. Once I got to like my mid twenties and on was when our relationship became better than it ever has been. Right. Like 25, 26, 27, like right around that age was when I would say our relationship, like really like we went from fighting, like once every week to no, fighting. No, we, like, we're fighting like we see each other fight. 10 minutes, yeah. 10 yeah. minutes the max, <laughs> then we start okay. fighting. So we went from fighting like every time we saw each other to like, and I remember it was so drastic. All of a sudden it was like, we fought like once a year or something like that. And like, I remember everyone being like, wow, like you and mom hardly ever fight anymore. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I just, I understand her better. And so I can acknowledge a big part of that was definitely my own personal growth that I had to go through. At the same time, you know, you obviously turned a corner too in respecting me because I had to draw specific lines with you. I made very clear boundaries that I wasn't able to make when I was younger because I loved and respected you so much that I was like, oh, I'll never do this to my mom. One of the ones I remember the most was when I was with the Rockets. In my second year with the Rockets, I remember I told you, I said, mom, if you come and stay at my house and you continually don't listen to what I say, you can no longer stay at my house. So for a year or for one season, when you would come and visit, you had to stay in a hotel. Remember I kept telling you like, don't wash and dry my clothes. And you would dry all my clothes and shrink all my clothes. And I was like, don't do this, don't do that. And like, I remember I stay in the hotel, but I don't remember it's because that. Yeah. You, sh you should be lucky I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, there was a, <laughs> so there's a, there's a point in my life when I was telling you everything that I would tell you, you wouldn't listen to me and you'd defy me. And I finally, it got to the point where I had to tell you like, I'm not letting you stay. And you, I literally made you stay in a hotel. And it was so, it was heartbreaking to me because obviously it's very painful and I was very close with you. And I was like, I don't want to do this to my mom, but I felt like that was the only way that I could, that's the only thing I could do for you to like respect me and listen to me. And I did that. And that was a short period of time, half a year later, you started to really like listen more to what I was trying to say. You would start respecting kind of the rules I had in my house. And that was the last time that we ever struggled with those issues. Right. And so um, I mean, I would say there's definitely growth on both ends um, that allowed us to kind of work through some of the conflict we had. So one of the things that me, Gaga, and we always talk about, uh, we always talk about how you and dad had values and rules in the house. And you really made us like abide by these values. Like if we didn't abide by these values, we couldn't do anything that we wanted to do, right? We wanted to play basketball, we wanted to hang out with friends, we wanted to play video games. But if we didn't abide by your values and your rules, like you wouldn't allow us to do that. Um, one, of the, one of the things that you really instilled in us that you always harped on us and that you always modeled for us was to take care of other people, to think about other people, to love other people, to be generous. That is something that, the reason why, you know, I have a philanthropic mindset, I credit to you, is because I saw you do that, right, all the time. How did you feel like that carried over into my life? I think that's um, something I'm really proud of you to doing that. Uh, I still remember um, when you was little, your team had few kids, they, they don't have parents around them. Um, if they want to play basketball for your team, they need people to bring them to the practice, um, take them to a away trip, um, you know, sometimes even feeding them. And also the great, it's, not good enough to play basketball, which is 2.0 and, and for middle school. Um, we, have, we have to help them for, um, for schoolwork. And so I remember I was like, Jeremy, you want, 
if those two need to play with us, they need to overcome this situation. And so you're actually willing to go with me every week, every every practice to go to Sunnyvale, bring them to Palo Alto, or even sometimes to Petrola Valley and send them back. That's a big comm- commitment for you, but you really want to do that and to keep those kids be able to play um, because they are very talented player. Then there are times we need to go travel. You, you will say, mom, can we take them? Can you take care of them? And also we have other parents willing to pay for their tickets. And so we just need to make sure they they okay in the room, things like that. So you really want to take care of them. And you I remember one time you was telling me, say, if when I grow up, I have money, I will take care of all those people. I want to help them. <laughs> And which you did that very, you know, you you take care of those f- homeless people, you're taking care of those kids in Palo, uh, East Palo Alto, and very proud of you doing that. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, that's something that you definitely, at first, it was you forcing me. So anytime there was a new kid who would come, right, like any of your friends, new kid, the first thing you would ask me, like, oh, there's a new kid coming, oh. Uh, do they like basketball? Oh, my son will play basketball with them. And I mean, I cannot tell you how many times it's like, you're just volunteering me like, oh, Jeremy, we'll go play basketball with him. Oh, Jeremy. And I'm like, they would come, they wouldn't even speak English. And then they wouldn't even know how to play basketball. And then I would like, couldn't talk to them. But I couldn't also like, but I didn't know how to play basketball with them because they didn't know. And I was just like, this is so awkward. But it was something that you forced me to do. And I hated, I hated doing it. But then over time, the more I did it, the more I start to understand why we do it, right? And I but think actually, that was what was important. I also want you to take care of that, not just basketball. No, I know that basketball is just yeah. a, a way to take care of them. But I'm just saying that philosophy started with you and you forced us to be in positions where we weren't comfortable and where we had to learn how to love other people beyond what we would have wanted to do ourselves. So you really stretched you know, our comfort zone for how much we were willing to love somebody else. So I think, you know, I definitely owe you a lot of, you know, credit and gratitude for for always instilling that in me. So I'm just trying to follow in the footsteps and follow that kind of that legacy and, and that trail that you blazed for me. So I appreciate that. Actually, um, I think that comes from Popo. She did that for even, you know, she has scholarship in China right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean... They talk about generational curses, but there's also, you know, positives and benefits and and values that are also generational, generational legacy as well. So when I graduated from Harvard, um, I really wanted to play basketball. You knew that my whole life. I just wanted to keep playing basketball. I asked you and dad, is that okay? I'm about to graduate with a Harvard degree, but I really want to play basketball. I don't know how much money I can make. I don't know how long I can play, but it's my dream. You and dad said, okay. I think it's a, it's a, Junior year? No, senior, senior year. year. Senior, senior year. And that summer, you say you want to play basketball, so you need to be sent to training. And we try to figure it out and find a place which is not, 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 not cheap. And so we need to put in money for that. And I was like, okay, you really want to do that? I'm like, there's a lot of financial pressure. So now you're like, I'm telling you, I need to train for the NBA draft. And you're like, uh, and one day, two years, one day you call me and you're like, Hey, Jeremy, uh, so I found some money. Don't worry about where it's coming from, but I found some money. I'll give you two years to chase your basketball dream. But after two years, if it's not working out, then you need to call it quits. I said, okay, good deal. I got two years. I'll do my best. I never asked where that money came from. And you told me, you said, I know that you're not eating until you're full, right? But if you want to have a chance to make the NBA, you have to eat until you're full because you're training really hard. You start missing meal time because the training at, bas- at school for basketball. And I was like, okay, so you need to, you need not just feeding yourself extra money for it yourself. Also, you need to pay for a coach because coach doesn't eat either. You're, and so I said, like, okay, Jeremy, this is the money you can use. Just don't worry. Just you know, because I know you are saving money, so you maybe get hungry. So I said, no, you have to keep, you know, get some nutrition. So so I just tell you, say, okay, those are the money. Um, I don't have income coming in for the house. The only thing I can do is just take out my 401k. So I just take it off on my 401k. So at that time, I didn't ask questions. Made the MBA. Fast forward, 
you didn't tell me until seven years into the NBA. And when I thought of it, I was like, you know, what? where did that money come from? Because we had no money. Like we had no money. We tried, we exhausted every last thing just to even get me through Harvard. And Harvard wasn't even, we got to the point where Harvard wasn't even going to give me any more student loans because I had taken all the student loans available. So I was like, where'd you get that money from? And that's where you said, I took it out of my 401k. And that's when it hit me seven years after making the NBA where I was like, wow, you really went down to like, you gave out your retirement fund for me to be able to chase my dream, which at that time I was trying to do something that had never been done before by anybody. Right. Like, so, um, I appreciate that. That's the ultimate sacrifice story. That was a good investment that's on your part. Good, yeah, that's true. <laughs> good investment. Good investment. <laughs> One thing I've heard you say through the years is, uh, you know, when I think about what are your most proud moments of me, I, always kind of thought that you would say like, oh, this game or an insanity or when you won a championship or whatever. But when you really think about it, the one thing you always say to me was actually you're, you're most proud for this one moment when I shared my testimony, right? Um, can you explain why you chose that example and what made you so proud um, about that? I think because um, for your status, you know, you are a role model for a lot of people. People look up you and people respect you. It, it's kind of like a high standard. And people usually just sharing the successful, the, the, the culture want to hear successful story. And, and, but you're willing to let people see your weakness mm -hmm. and let people know that's from people, from human's perspective, that's a failure. But you're willing to share. You let people know who you are and what's, you know, what you, what you value. It's really, it's not on the earth. I think that to me, um, it, you have to be very strong to share, it, to be able to do that. I mean, I, rem I still remember that time when I heard, I was like, oh, Jeremy, don't say it, don't say it, <laughs> you know. Um, but I know you, what you're doing. You're doing it because you want to help other people, let people know you could be in the tough situation. But if you rely on God, things can turn around. And, and, but that's, I think that's something in, in current society, people don't do that. Yeah. So I'll fill in some of the stories. So I had gone through... Uh, you know, a couple years, two straight years of injuries. And, you know, I was with the Brooklyn Nets. I finally got my opportunity that I had waited like five years for. And then I got hurt for two straight years. So I never even got a chance to prove what I felt like I wanted to prove. And after that, I came back from these injuries, but, you know, I wasn't really the same player. And then I was out of the NBA. I couldn't find a job in the NBA. And I remember at that time, you know, it was scheduled to share my testimony two weeks later. And I was thinking about canceling it because I was so heartbroken. And I was like, I don't really know. I don't know. Like if I get on stage and I share, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ball. Like I'm going to ball my eyes out. I'm going to cry. And I remember you and other people were like, don't do it. Don't share. Like, like, <laughs> like don't share, don't share everything because like, you know, it, that might not go well. And I remember just thinking about it and I was like, you know, God is good through the highs and the lows. And it's easy when you're successful to say, God is so good. It's really hard and to, to also believe and say that when you feel like you're really going through it and, and, and you're, you know, in a, at a low point. And so, yes, I went out there, I, I cried, I shared my testimony and, um, and I, it, it went viral. I got laughed at, I got ridiculed, I got criticized by millions of fans online. Um, but then there was another, you know, there were other like millions of people who were so encouraged by it. Right. And so it was very polarizing because it was like, half the people were laughing at me, criticizing me and making, turning me into an internet meme and a joke. And then the, and, and then the other half were like, wow, I really resonated with that. I really related with that. I'm so glad that you shared that, that part of your story. And I think for me, again, it comes from, you know, your parenting of one thing that I always respect about you was if you believe in something, 
you were willing to see it through, even though other people are going to laugh at you. And that was your whole life, right? Like even as a parent, like people always laughed at you, ridiculed you. That is coming from, coming from coworkers, coming from your friends and coming from your own family, right? Like how many times did your, <laughs> did your own mom tell you you were making a mistake by letting us play basketball or, or how many times did your family who, you know, early on, none of them were believers, none of them were Christians. And they felt like you were crazy for, for becoming a Christian, right? Like you always felt like if this is who I am and this is what I believe in, I'm willing to go and do this or stand on this regardless of what other people think. And so that was an example where like, because I seen you do that, I also wanted to, you know, I, I did want to say like, God, this is for your glory. And if I have to be vulnerable in my lowest moments, um, as painful as it may be, as hard as it may be, I'm going to do my best to do it. Um, so. Very proud of you. Thanks. So. Yeah, that pretty much wraps up the conversation uh, with my mom. I mean, we could be here for days talking about stories and stories and stories. And maybe we'll have you back for another episode. Oh, yeah. You need to tell my my after school care. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, there's more there's more for us to talk about. But for now, we're going to we're going to end right here. Thank you so much, mom, for uh, sharing everything. I know that it was emotional. You don't often, you know, cry. Um, mm -hmm. You don't often cry. Every so. time I cry, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to come over and give you a hug right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.